This morning, there's a lot of exciting stuff happening at Village Baptist. You know, we've been in a somewhat of a series, I guess it turned out to be, on Great Awakening. Two weeks ago, we came together and had only one worship service at 9.46 in the morning based on Daniel 9, 4 through 6. And uh, that worship service was prayer and worship. Over two hours, we gathered in the room, and God moved among us in a mighty way. And, uh, you know, one of the things that happens when revival begins to happen in our hearts, we see people step up and step forward in ways of obedience that they'd never seen before. And one of the exciting things that we're going to experience this morning as a church is uh, we're sending one of our own that's grown up in this church for the last 25 years uh, out to take on a position as a youth pastor. And so I want to invite my son, Chris, to come up and... um, He's the little guy in the family. <laughs> but uh, Chris, tell us where you're going to. And uh, I actually, last Sunday, uh, I was told by a few people, he stopped and mentioned I was getting voted on. Um, so it's, uh, it's a little town called Cowarts, Alabama. Um, it's about 25 minutes from uh, where I go to school at the Baptist College of Florida. And uh, it's called Faith Baptist Church, and I start next Sunday as their youth minister. Okay. So, you know, there's several steps in the process, and of course, the very first step is the step of salvation. And, uh, and then, you know, we, we talk about spiritual development, and he's in college now studying pastoral ministry. And the step that we're taking today is we're giving him uh, what's called a certificate of license and uh, that license says that uh, given evidence of God's call, uh, we are licensing him to the gospel ministry. And that's a step towards future ordination. And so as we do that, I want to invite our pastors, uh, Dan and Sean, to come up along with Matt and myself. And, um, and then um, one of our elders, I think our other elders are out. Joe, would you come up? And uh, Chris kind of come center stage here and... Uh, and Joe, if you would, let's get on either side of him, everybody. And Joe, if you would kind of get in here and lead our prayer. Uh, he's going to need a microphone too, Matt, so that he can be heard. we just praying over Chris as we send him out. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, for the mighty work that you've done in Chris's life. Lord, from the time that he was dedicated to your service as a young child, Lord, you've watched over him. you guided his steps. You've taken him through journeys, Lord, when perhaps he thought he was alone. But never once was he truly alone. Father, you've been there to comfort and to encourage and to guide him. And Father, we're thankful this morning that as your servants, as men and women that have dedicated our hearts to God, we celebrate and what Chris has done, and what he will do. And Father, even more, what you will do through Chris. Father, although our laying on of hands confers no special secret authority, Father, it is a sign of our submission to you. And the fact that we are laying upon him your charge, just as Elijah and Elisha exchanged the cloak of the ministry. Father, this cloak has now been exchanged to Chris. May you bless his life. May you bless his ministry. May you prepare him as he goes forward. He'll still face difficult challenges and difficult times. But, Lord, you walk before him. You walk behind him. And the God of angel armies stands Mm. beside him. Whom has Chris to fear? Lord, we're just thankful so much for the work you've done and the testimony that Chris has for you. Bless him, lead him, guide him, direct him. All for your glory. In Christ's name we pray. Amen. 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 Love you, son. And here is your certificate of license. Amen. You know, 
the Bible says raise up a child in the way they should go, and when they're old, they won't depart. It doesn't say anything about those in-between years. And it really puts you to the test. And sometimes you wonder, Lord, do I have what it takes to be sustained through this? And are we going to ever make it? And, and all those kinds of things. So I just want to give you a word of encouragement to parents that are going through trying times. God will see you through. And last week, is, uh, as we continued on in, we got into 1 Samuel 14 when we talked about Jonathan, the son of Saul, king of Israel, and how God worked in Jonathan's life and he was one of the, he and his father had the only two swords left in all of Israel. And Jonathan and his armor bearer went out to, to take on the armies of the Philistines. See, God said he can save by many or he can save by few. And with two men, Jonathan and his young fella, armor bearer, a young man, they went out and took on the Philistines and God defeated them. And what we see today is, is I want you to, to think about what it takes then as that courageous individual that stands against the, the flow of society, that stands against the flow of the world that's around us, what it takes to be able to stand. And we're going to talk about a shield today. You know, when I was a kid, I, I grew up in Gainesville, Georgia, up, in, up north of Atlanta on Lake Lanier. And I grew up uh, in an area where there weren't a lot of houses, you know. I go up there today, and I can't believe how many people have moved in. But we ran through the woods. We were boys that just had a lot of fun. We were up and down those hills and in the lake and uh, with or without permission and, and doing different kinds of things. And, and the younger group of us, uh, you know, it was me and about three or four of my friends. And, and then there was an older group, and it was led by my older cousin and his group of buddies. And, you know, when we played football on that little uh, ball field that we had in the back of somebody's yard, you know, it, they would kind of divide us up. And so you'd get on, you know, the big boys team, you know, sometimes. But oftentimes we found ourselves, you know, at odds with them. And we had two places there that we liked to hang out. There were the dirt fields. We had the little dirt field. It's across the road from my home. It's up on the hill. My dad had excavated some land or some dirt out of there to fill in somewhere else where he was building. And then about a mile away, we had the thing called the big dirt field. And uh, it was much, much more vast, and uh, the power lines ran along it, and um, the, the, the rainwaters had eroded, and so there are deep gullies there. And sometimes we'd get over there and... You know, we, uh, the younger guys, we just had fun having dirt clod battles. You know, that clay sticking together. And sometimes it had a rock in it, you know, and you would chunk it at each other and you're ducking down in those gullies and you're finding some safety, a little bit of shielding. But, but then sometimes, you know, the other boys came along, the older ones, and they came to wipe us out. I mean, these big old guys, you... You know, they seem so much bigger, although they've only had us by about three years, but they, they just seem so much bigger. And, and, and they would come after us. And, and we found that the only effective way after they had decided to run on us was to have something like a garbage can lid to be a shield and try to block the clods of the enemy. And as a Christian, you're being attacked by the clods of the enemy. Satan comes against you, the devil. And too many Christians are unaware of the crafty schemes that he comes up with. And, and what he does is he looks for every opportunity to charge your position and to hurl a clod of devastation. As a matter of fact, when Paul wrote to the Ephesians, he said, put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of of the devil. And Peter, in his writing, he said, Be sober minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, he prowls around like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. And so Satan's picture is that hungry beast that's looking for that one to devour. A number of years ago, uh, when our, our cat Bella was just a little kitten, I remember it was on the back porch and uh, I think it was in a box there uh, outside for a little while, and it was just screaming that baby kitten scream, and, and I went out, and I looked up, and a big owl had flown up and landed in a limb out in the backyard. You know what that big owl was after? It was after that baby kitten crying. That's the way Satan wants to come after you. 
And, and when we follow the biblical standard, though, we find victory. I love this verse in Micah 7, 8. As a matter of fact, it's a great verse to underline and, and to grab a hold of, but it says, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, when I fall. It's not if I fall, because we're all going to fall. Rejoice not over me, my enemy, when I fall. I shall rise. And when I sit in the darkness, the Lord will be a light to me. And so those are words of encouragement that the Lord gives us. And then in the book of Romans, in Romans chapter 8, verse 37, the Scripture says, No, in all these things we are more than conquerors through Him who loved us. So God gives us a promise that we are more than conquerors. So we're able to say with Micah the prophet, Rejoice not over me, O my enemy, when I fall, for I shall rise. And though I sit in darkness, the Lord is the light for me. And so... This morning, I want to, to zero us in over to Ephesians chapter 6, in which Paul lists out the equipment that a warrior needs. In verse 10, he says, finally. In other words, he's given all of this instruction to the people of Ephesus, and now he says, finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the schemes of the devil. For we do not wrestle against flesh and blood, but against the rulers, against the authorities, against the cosmic powers over this present darkness, against the spiritual forces of evil in the heavenly places. Therefore, take up the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand in the evil day and having all to, do, to, to, um, to stand firm. So he's telling us our battle is in the heavenlies. It's a spiritual battle. Therefore, take up this whole armor. Stand therefore, uh, having fastened on the belt of truth and having put on the breastplate of righteousness and as shoes for your feet, having put on the readiness given by the gospel of peace. In all circumstances, take up the shield of faith uh, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. And take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. And so Paul lays out all this armor. He describes the armor of a warrior, the warrior of Christ Jesus. And God's armor brings victory because it's more than just protective covering. As a matter of fact, it's the very life of Jesus Christ himself. Paul wrote to the Romans in chapter 13 and said, Put on the armor of light. Put on the Lord Jesus Christ. So when we do that, he becomes our hiding place and he becomes our shelter in the storm, just like he was for David. You know, David was a warrior. He was the king of Israel. He was also a humble shepherd. And David found that in the Lord, he had strength and he had protection. He had hiding. And so he was hidden in him, and when you're hidden in him, you can count on him, that is God, for victory. For he not only covers you as a shield, but he fills you with life. And so the very first thing that Paul talks about is put on that, that belt of truth. And that belt of truth is that which guards us against deception. There's deception all around us. Everyone is out to deceive us. And so we put on that belt of truth. We put on the breastplate of righteousness. And that guards our hearts against the accusations of Satan. That breastplate of righteousness guards us when Satan comes and says, well, you know, you're really not that good. You're really a bad person. Anybody ever feel like they're not that good? That, uh, you know, they don't measure up? You know, we look around and think, wow, I don't measure up to this guy. How many pastors do we have in the room this time? Hold your hands up for just a minute, okay? We got one, two, three, four. We got four pastors with us at this time. We had five in the last service. Down here on vacation. Guys, do you ever get around other pastors and think, man, I don't measure up? Anybody besides me ever feel like that? You know, don't measure up. And we deal with this and we deal with that. You see, that's Satan just accusing you. 
He's coming against you. You know, in our Christian circles, you know, we, we look at uh, Miss Molly across the room and think, oh, she's so sweet and so kind and such a great Christian lady. I, I never measure up to her. And she's probably sitting there looking at you and thinking, oh, you're so precious. I wish I could be like you. So you don't let Satan accuse you and bring you down because our righteousness, our breastplate of righteousness is found in Jesus Christ. Anything that you measure against me, you measure against Jesus Christ, who is not only the greatest human that ever lived, but he's the greatest God who ever came and gave his life and rose again that I might have life. And you put on the shoes, the gospel of peace. Those, that with the gospel of peace, we're able to advance into the, into the territory of the enemy. You know, when we go on mission and we find ourselves in the middle of Islamic peoples, you know, I found that always that you can advance into those territories because of the gospel of peace. In the villages in which uh, we now have mission workers in North Africa, those villages are villages that have been prayed over prior to, praying for God to open the door and to provide the way and, and to give us the man of peace in that village that we could go to and establish. And it's amazing how God does the work. He talks about the shield of faith, and I'm going to dig into that here in just a second, and the helmet of salvation. You know, the head is the seat of our mind, which, when it's laid a hold of the sure gospel of hope, you know, uh, of eternal life, it's not going to receive those false doctrines. It's not going to talk about, oh, I've got to work my way to Christ, because Christ came to you. There's nothing you can do to, to earn a relationship with Jesus Christ. He's already come. All we can do is open our hearts and receive what He's already done. And He talks about the sword of the Spirit. And so today I want us to dig into the shield. What does our shield look like? Well, he says in verse 16, In all circumstances take up the shield of faith, with which you can extinguish all the flaming darts of the evil one. The shield of faith. The shield of faith, it diverts and it, dist- and it extinguishes Satan's arrows. And, and so the shield of faith spoken of here makes him ineffective. Our faith in which Jesus Christ is the author and the perfecter the, the, from the beginning to the end, the, the Alpha and the Omega is like the golden shield. It's precious and it's solid and it's substantial. In the Roman armor, there were two shields that, that each soldier had. One was a small shield, more like a round shield, kind of like we used on the dirt field, the, the, the trash can shield used in close combat. Fighting sword to sword. But the, but the other shield is the word that is used here. And it was a large shield. It was large enough that if a soldier was in, injured in battle, he could be laid upon the shield and he could be taken off the battlefield as if it were a stretcher. It was about four feet tall and approximately two and a half feet wide. And it was kind of an amazing kind of thing. And it was a very effective uh, uh, implement for the Roman foot soldiers to hold it up because the, all, the enemy would oftentimes ditch, uh, dip their arrows in pitch and light them and fire them. You've seen it in the movie. And when those lit, it, lit arrows would hit a, a roof or something, it'll burn the building down. And, and just imagine if a lit arrow penetrated into a soldier, you know, it would be a mortal wound. But the shield, this big shield, could kneel behind it, could be behind it, could be covered with it. And so the Roman soldiers would hold these shields up, and the fiery darts would be extinguished. And so Paul is saying, you know, our shield of faith, he says the evil one of uh, Satan is looking to, to fire these fiery darts at us all the time. And sometimes those darts are very visible. David describes them in Psalm 64. He says those visible darts. He says, hide me from the counsel of the evildoers, from the tumult of those who do iniquity, who have sharpened their tongue like a sword. They aim bitter speech as their arrow. He's talking about those things that are visibly formed against us. You know, we've all faced those kinds of things in life. Things that have been visibly formed against us. And when the enemy's coming against us, where are we to stand? We're to stand in the protection of the shield of faith. A glorious shield. The shield of Jesus Christ. The most beautiful shield that we could ever possess. The greatest shield that we could ever know. 
the most costly shield that could ever be held, the shield of Jesus Christ, our faith in Him. And he talks about those invisible things that come. What are those invisible things? Nobody else sees them. Temptation. You know, we're all tempted, and the Bible says there's no temptation that's overcome you, but such as is common to man, but God will, with the temptation, provide a way of escape. You know, we, we are all tempted. You may have been tempted this morning already. If you've not been tempted today, you will be tempted today. Temptation's going to come. And anxiety and fear and depression and, and discouragement. And then angry words come, and bitter words, such as criticism. Sometimes there's betrayal, and not everybody knows it, but deep inside we're carrying that, self, that stuff, and, and, and they disprove our friendships. You know, when you were a kid, you, you were probably taught this somewhere about kindergarten. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words could never harm me. How many of y'all remember that? But that's not true. Words hurt. Words are painful. You know, in that previous verse I just shared, David said they sharpen their tongue like a sword. He realizes the hurt. The Bible says arrows are not, going, are, are not possible. It says they are probable. And, and, and so, you know, we're going to, to be the target. Every believer is going to be shot at. The Bible says this shield of faith is effective to divert these arrows. In your Christian life, you are going to be criticized knowingly or unknowingly. It happens. People get criticized every day. You are going to be tempted. You recognize that. There's going to be anxiety and there's going to be pressure. But faith will cause those painful arrows to lose their effect. Yes, you don't mean they don't have an effect. You know, there are times when, when we feel depressed. There are times when we sense anxiety. There are times when we are the recipients of criticism. But the Bible tells us our faith will make those things least, less effective and eventually of no consequence. But it's not just a faith in anything, it's a faith that's held firmly in Christ Jesus. And for the person who doesn't have faith, they don't have a shield. They don't have anything to protect them. They don't have anything to guard them. The Lord is a shield for me. This is a, 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 is a theme of what we're talking about in Great Awakening. Our, our choir sang it two weeks ago. Oh Lord, you are a shield for me. You are the defender and the lifter of my head. He's our shield. He allows us to walk in victory. But if you don't know Christ Jesus, you don't have that shield. As a matter of fact, you don't even have a shield for eternity. Jesus Christ becomes a shield for the eternal destination of our spirit. He carries us out of the battle on His shield to a heavenly home, but without Christ. The Bible says it's an outer darkness. It's like a, a lake that burns with fire and brimstone. It's a place called hell. It's the abode of all those who've rejected God. But Jesus Christ says, I want to be your shield. The Bible says, but as many as received him, to them did he give the right to become the children of God. And when you're holding on to your shield, this is what you're effectively doing. You're effectively holding on to the very promise of God. Think about this. Faith is holding on to the promises of God. You know, you exercise faith every day. Now, some people say, well, I don't exercise faith, but think about this, you do. You go to a doctor that you've never met. You sit down in a little room and let them examine you. And you'll be examined, you'll be told that you have such and such, uh, you know, a, a, of an issue or an illness or whatever else it may be. He'll write you a prescription that you can't read. You'll take it to a pharmacist that you don't know. You'll take the by direction, not knowing the effect of it. And every step along the way, you're exercising faith. 
You came to church this morning. You exercised faith to get in the car to drive over here or to get out the door and to walk over here. You exercised faith to sit in these nice, comfortable theater seats and find that it didn't collapse. Are these seats comfortable? We get spoiled. Every once in a while I go and preach in a church and for somebody, and I'm sitting on a hard pew. Man, I'm thinking, y'all need to pray for theater seats. But, you know, we exercise faith over and over again. This stage is not falling through, although it's put together with metal studs and, and plywood. I exercise faith. We exercise faith all the time. We don't need more faith. We've got all the faith we need. We just need to know how to use it. And so the shield of faith, you know, it encompasses the promises of God. Listen to what God says in the book of, of Deuteronomy. In the book of Deuteronomy, the Bible tells us, be strong. Be strong and be courageous. You know, we don't have to, to be beaten back. We don't have to be overcome. The Scripture tells us, be strong and be courageous. Do not be afraid or don't tremble at them, for the Lord your God is the one who goes with you. He's the God of angel armies, right? Right? He's the God who doesn't leave you behind. He's the God who is watching over you. As we discovered um, that He is the very God who sings over you. He sings over you. He loves you. And so He will not fail you or forsake you. And if you believe that, you can go right on with what old King David said in chapter 28 of the Psalms. He said, the Lord is my strength and my, what? Shield. He's my strength and my shield. My heart trusts in Him and I am helped. Therefore my heart exalts. That word exalts means to rejoice with great rejoicing. And with my song, I shall thank Him. And whenever you, uh, you know, can stand and say, God... I'm trusting you and I'm not leaning on my own understanding. This is what you're doing. You're taking up that shield of faith that holds on to the very promise of God that says you are more than a conqueror. You're more than a conqueror. But you know something else you do with that shield? With that shield, you, you link up with God's people. You link up. You see, each Roman soldier's shield, it had a couple of crooks on, on each side. So a soldier going into battle could literally hook his shield up with the shield of the soldier that was next to him. The picture of it is uh, it's kind of like these choir chairs. Since he's got them disconnected, I'm going to mess up Matt's choir loft. But this choir chair, you know, it's a nice chair. It's a comfortable chair, right? I mean, it's great to, to sit down in, and it works. You can lean back, right? But, you know, we've got other choir chairs here. Matt, forgive me. But these choir chairs are kind of cool because they've got these crooky things on each side right here, and they, they link up with each other. And so um, let's see if I can make it work. Yeah, there. So... They link together, right? And so when I lean one back, hey, isn't that cool? And this is the way that Roman soldier's shield was put together. So it, it had them on either side. These have them on either side. And they could, they could form a, an armory, so to speak, as they went into battle. And uh, the, the, the Latin word is a phalanx. I don't know, just a big group of guys. And, and they came together, and it was in a very, very effective strategy in facing an enemy. And so, they didn't fight alone. They didn't fight alone. They linked up with other soldiers. And here's the principle we need to grab a hold of, is warriors do not fight alone. We need each other. If you're trying to be a Lone Ranger Christian, you know, you're like, uh, you're going uh, to find that every single day you're going to stumble, you're going to fail, and, and you're going to get discouraged because you're trying to be a Lone Ranger Christian. 
And, and you know, the beautiful thing about an army, in an army there are allies. There are allies. As a matter of fact, you know, we, we, we refer to, in our armies, we re- refer to it as a, as a band of brothers. And you know, in this church, all of us that serve in the military, that have served in the military, you know, we, we have a connectivity to a degree. There's that linking up. And what we discover is I receive strength from you. You receive strength from me. I fall down and, and you're there to, to pick me up. And you fall down and I'm there to, to pick you up. And we live in a postmodern, post Christian culture. We live in a nation that's taken 58 million innocent lives through abortion. We live in a world that's lost in the darkness without Jesus Christ and without hope. And we face this world together. It doesn't mean that we come to church as a spectator. Just sitting on the back row or up in the balcony and not involving ourselves. Now, I'm not hitting you for being in the back row. I sit in the back row sometimes when I'm not the preacher. Sometimes I like the balcony. There's a great view from up there. The view's really good. You can see how good I look up there. Really good. But this is what we happen. You know, we, what I'm saying, we sit back disengaged and we say something like this. Well, you know, my relationship with Jesus Christ is a kind of a personal thing. It's between him and me. And you know what? You're right. That relationship is. You know, when Peter was having that discussion with Jesus uh, before he would have sinned, you know, he was saying, you know, he kept wanting to go back. Well, what about this disciple? What about him? And Jesus said, hey, Peter, just shut up for a minute. It's not about him. I'm talking to you right now. And that's the personal side of that salvation. It's between us and Jesus Christ. It's between us and God. But the other side of it is, is that salvation, once it links us up with Jesus Christ, it links us up with all of our brothers and sisters. It links us up with the church. And if we're not linked up, there's no wonder that we're giving in. If we're not linked up, there's no wonder, you know, that that some of us still have some of those habits that frustrate us. You know, we need help. And, and, and this battle that we're in is compared to, to that of a warrior. I was watching a Spartan race on television early this morning. You know, I woke up Sunday mornings. I tend to sleep till like 6 o'clock. And, uh, and I woke up, and it was 528. I heard something rattle in the kitchen. And this is what I'm thinking because I know my guys will come downstairs about 11, 1130 at night and grab something else to eat. I'm thinking, who in the world is hungry at 530 in the morning? What in them? I don't, I don't know what rattled. But I woke up. So I go and get my cup of coffee. And I flip on the TV. And it's on a sports network. And they've got the Spartan race there. If you're familiar with Spartan, or maybe you're not familiar with Spartan, it's a running race. But it's also a strength race, an agility race. And this particular one was being held out in the mountains. I believe it was in Colorado. Man, you see these people, they're in, they're in top shape. I mean, they, they, they're in great, great shape. And here they come running through, and they've thrown the javelin at the, at the, at the hay bales, and they've uh, lifted heavy loads and carried them up and down the hill and everything. And, man, they're looking good. And, you know, the first and second and third place finishers crossing the line. And then they go back to some guy who looks like me. He's struggling on the mountain getting down it. He's hurt. He's got aches and pains. But the guys that had crossed the finish line, they said, let's go back and get George. Let's help him through. And there they go running back up the mountain after doing that that incredible feat of endurance and strength. And old George could barely walk. And and, and they came together and they, they, they formed an arm bridge, two of them underneath him, and picked him up and brought him down the mountain. And when it came to the overhang, uh, uh, whatever it is, you know, uh, circle doohickey, circle doohickey. uh, It's not true monkey bars, it's those swinging things. Rings, thank you. Did all the choir dress in green, or the praise team in green this day uh, on purpose? Black, white, and green, green. okay, just curious. Okay, the, the rings, okay? He didn't have the strength to do it. They held him up to touch each ring and hit the cowbell at the end. 
And here they are coming up on the, front, on the finish line. And before you can get to the finish line, you've got to jump over a line of fire. They got him. And they're carrying him over. And he's finishing the race. You see, we come together as a people of God. We come together and the Lord has called us to be warriors. And when we hold on to our shield, we're effectively saying, you know, not only do I hold on to the promises of God, but I hold on to the fact I hold on to the very fact that I want to be a part of this people. I want to be a part of this church. If you're on vacation and you don't have a church at home, you need to go home and find one. And if you're not on vacation and you're visiting here, I pray today that this would be the church that God would bring you into. You know, this is a great church. It's made up of great people. I've been here for 23 years. And it's just... I had to back up and count there for a second. You you, you know, the time has flown by. I don't know where it's gone. But, you know, it was just a little tiny group of us. But God has worked among us, and he's done great and awesome things. And you need to link up with God's people. And when you're holding on that shield, you're effective so as to stand firm in the power of God. You see, the shield of faith says absolutely nothing about your ability. But what it does speak of, it it speaks about God's ability. It talks about standing in the power of Almighty God. Uh, In the Old Testament, there's this dude by the name of Goliath. Goliath is nine feet six inches tall. The Bible says that King Saul stood a head above all of his peers. He was at least six feet tall. And, and, and there's this giant staring at them. And this giant is taunting the children of Israel and saying, send somebody over to meet me. Send somebody over to fight me. The Bible says he had a spear whose handle was 14 feet long and the tip of the spear alone weighed 15 pounds. That's about the weight of a, of a, of a shot put. And and the spear itself weighed 40 pounds. And he had on armor that weighed over 125 pounds. I mean, that dude looks like a warrior, doesn't he? Looks like Cliff going down the road doing that triathlon. He's a warrior. And the Bible says that King Saul was standing there head and shoulders above everybody else. And Goliath is taunting and saying, one of you come over here and fight me. And every one of them stood back and they stood back naturally. And I use that word purposely. Naturally. Because they're thinking in their own strength, what can I do? And that's a picture of so many Christians today. It may be, uh, it, it may be you. You know, for, for every one of us trying to grow and progress in the Christian life, you know, there's an ugly giant that, that stands and taunts, taunts us and says, you're not going to make it. you got a past, and you got to get past me. It may be an attitude. It may be a filthy habit. It may be a grudge or a temptation that takes us down from time to time. But that giant stands there, and that giant taunts you, and that giant mocks you and says, you can't go. Until you deal with me. And the problem is oftentimes we try to do it naturally. We try to do it in our own strength. And along comes a young man who'd been a shepherd. He wasn't even a part of the army yet. And his name was David. And David steps out from that Israelite army. He's got a slingshot, you know, not the kind of, like you can buy in the store with a big old rubber band on it. His slingshot is a, is a leather uh, sheath kind of a thing that's long, got a long attachment on it. And he picks up five smooth stones. And that giant is taunting. He's mocking. He's putting down, David, you're sending out a boy to face me because y'all are all too afraid. Who is your God? I am a Philistine, and you, you're Israelite chickens. And David goes out, and he takes one of those stones, and he begins to spin that slingshot around. And he's spinning, it's getting faster and faster, and that guy's standing there mocking him. And suddenly he lets go, and that stone flies, and bop, and out on the ground. 
the giant lays dead. How did David do it? Well, 1 Samuel 17, three chapters past where we were last week, it tells us, Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin, but I, I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have taunted. And this day the Lord will deliver you into my hands, and I will strike you down and remove your head from you, and will give it to the birds and the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not deliver by sword or by spear, For the battle is the Lord's, and He will give you into our hands. Now that's faith. Jonathan, his best friend, had faith, and he went and fought the Philistines three chapters earlier. David comes out with five smooth stones, and he has faith in God. It's not by spear, it's not by sword, but by the Lord of hosts, the God of Israel. And he said, this day the Lord is going to give you over to me. It's not my battle. It's not my skill, but it's faith in the Lord. And that battle belongs to the Lord. And and you know what? In in all of our lives, we can give over to God. And let God take the victory and, and, and push us through as we walk with that shield of faith. And my prayer for you this morning is that you would know that the shield of faith is absolutely essential. It's absolutely essential. You will never have the winning walk without the shield of faith. And that you would know you've got to hang on to it and hold it up. You've got to use it. And that you would hold on to the promises of God. To hold on to his promises. That you'd link up. We need each other. I'm grateful for friends and family. I'm grateful for those friends that I can call on and say, Hey, can you help me out with this thing? Or they'll check on me and say, Hey man, how you doing? And finally, stand firm in the power of God. This morning, I want to invite you. You've never received a shield of faith. You've never received Christ Jesus. But His Spirit's dwelling and dealing with you right now. I want to invite you after we pray. We're going to sing a song. I want you to invite you to come and say, Pastor, I want to trust Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. Some of you, it's time to link up with the church family. I want to invite you to come and say, Pastor, God is leading us to this church family. Some of you might have an area of prayer that you just say, would you pray with me that I can walk in the strength of the Lord's power and overcome this giant in my life. But I want to stand firm for the battle is the Lord's. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, thank you for this day. And thank you for the way you've worked in our hearts and in our lives. Father, we stand here to honor you. I pray for those that are in that struggle right now between life and death, that they would choose life in Christ Jesus. I pray for those that are making decisions about church membership. And Lord, I pray for those who are going through the battles of life and facing giants. Lord, make them more than conquerors through Christ Jesus. We give you praise in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's stand together. Would you come right now?